Cool. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this class, Modeling Digital Wellness with Lee Chantal. I'm so thrilled to introduce you to LC, to Lee Chantal, about this topic. Such an interesting topic, cyber psychology and um, digital wellness. You know, I think um, it's a topic that's come up a lot in just our check-ins and kind of casually, but comes up all the time in chats with teens, with parents. And um, I think teens can, I think, you know, fair, fair enough. Um, I feel like young people can kind of tune out a little bit and go, oh, I don't need another person telling me that I shouldn't be on TikTok. <laughs> but <laughs> this, um, having like had a look at what you're talking about today, I'm so excited about this because it's, um, it's, uh, deeper than that and it's what's needed and yeah I think it's such an important topic so thank you for agreeing to do this with us my pleasure Mandy thanks for asking great um before we get into it I'd love to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that we're meeting on today um, for me that's the gubby gubby or cubby cubby people so I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past present and emerging and acknowledge that sovereignty here on this land has never been ceded um, and I'd also like to extend that respect out to the traditional owners of the lands, wherever you're joining us from live or watching the recording. Um, yeah. And with that, I'd like to hand over to you to take us through this awesome topic. <laughs> sure. Thank you, Mandy. Um, I will share my screen now and get into the slides. Um, okay. Can you see that? Yeah. Cool. And I'm hoping... Yeah, my clicker works. Awesome. Even better. So welcome today. Thank you for having me. Thanks for joining. I'm Lee Chantel and we're talking about modelling digital wellness today. So also like Mandy, I just want to give an acknowledgement of country, thanking all um, the people who have the traditional owners of all the lands that we're on for looking after the lands we're on and um, all the work that they do and the respect for those people and wherever you are as well and um, always is always will be today here's a few things what we're going to go through so if you got a pen and a notepad that might help with some notes and we're going to talk about digital wellness so you might not know the term so we'll cover that we're going to understand the consumption of technology how to balance our needs for technology and how to practice conscious and mindful healthy digital habits. I'm going to give some tips and tricks to help with this and try to think of technology as a tool and not a compulsion. So I'll be using my digital equilibrium model to help guide you through that today. And the aim of this is to use the skills that you can model healthy online behaviours. Um, feel free to take photos, screenshots of all the slides as we go. So here's just a bit about me. Um, my background, I worked in social media marketing, online advertising and content creation for over two decades. And um, this made me realize about what happens with social media. So I knew the hows, I knew um, why things worked or how they worked. And I taught people about that. But then it made me sort of think about how come things are working like this? Like what's the underlying stuff behind it? And why does it act like that? So this was really interesting to me. And that led me to think about why do we behave, think and feel certain ways because of the influence of the technology? And also from that, how have these online social practices actually changed the way we interact and communicate? So that cannot just be how we interact with people online, but also in person, how that's changed. And I had two inspirations that um, inspired me to study. One is Sherry Turkle, and she's a lecturer and an author from MIT in the US. And Jamie Bartlett, um, he worked with a think tank called Demos in the US, in the UK. And he now um, does a lot of work with BBC, including a podcast and a book, um, uh, the Missing Crypto Queen, it's called. So all about a lady called Ruja and One Coin, which is a blockchain thing, and how she took a lot of people's money. And um, this inspired me, all this information, that Jamie and Sherry and um, all these things I was thinking about. 
and became passionate about cyber psychology. So when you think about cyber, that's, you know, the digital space, that's technology, that's devices, and psychology is the thoughts, the feelings, and the behaviours that we have. So that's how that's linked. And then cyber security, how we um, deal with security online and digital well-being. Um, so the well-being in regards to digital spaces and digital and technology. And I'm really mindful, um, I'm really interested in mindful and conscious use of technology too, and how we can encourage other people to do that. Um, I graduated with first class honours with the Bachelor of Psychology 2020, and currently I'm a PhD candidate, and I'm looking into the rollout of autonomous vehicles in Australia. So they're like driverless vehicles or self-driving vehicles. So yeah, it will be my second year in February. So it's pretty, it's a lot of work, but it's really interesting because it's a new field of um, research. I'm also a university tutor. So I teach um, students um, about interpersonal skills, group facilitation and coaching and positive psychology. And my aim is to be a lecturer in cyber psychology. And I'm also a digital wellness educator. So that's pretty much why I'm here today. And um, my website is digitalequilibrium.com that you can have a look at. So I'd love to hear about your digital habits. Um, and what you can do is, if we had a lot of people here, I would um, ask you to maybe type in the chat box or raise your hand. But maybe let's just have a bit of a reflection and think about some of these things. Um, I'd like you, I'll just read out all the questions. So um, you can go through these at your own time. Had you heard of digital wellness before this? Um, when do you use technology the most in a non-healthy way? Do you ever think about balancing your technology? Have you thought about what being conscious and mindful online means? And who is the person who influences you the most with your technology habits? So maybe if you're watching this later on, not live, maybe just pause this for a second and just take a few moments to write some answers down about those questions. But we'll move on. So the biggest issue that can be wrapped up in like a really succinct way, in a really concise way, is from Sherry, as I mentioned before, one of my inspirations. And she says that we expect more from technology and less from each other. So we're excessively using technology and digital devices, and this comes at the expense of other aspects in our life, whether it's our relationships, our um, sleep, um, what we can or can't do at work, at uni, at school, those sort of things. And we need greater awareness of how technology works. You know, heaps of people turn on their phone, turn on their um, laptop or computer, and they have no idea about how things work in the, the back end and the behind the scenes. And because of this, why do we think, feel and behave certain ways? And how do we balance those sort of aspects? So because we're in this always on digital culture, we need digital boundaries because they will help to make us thrive in not just the online spaces, but also in the way we interact with people offline. And without these digital boundaries, this can turn devices from tools into compulsions. And here's a few stats. So the average smartphone user unlocks their phone 150 times a day. That's quite a lot touches their phone over 2,000 times a day and will spend three hours a day on their phone. And an average of five and a half years on, of their life, the whole life, on social media. A lot of smartphone users, over half, cannot go for one hour without checking their phone. And I'm sure you do it as well, where you compulsively look at your phone because you think you've heard a notification or it's buzzed or something like that. So 67% of people do that without a ring or a notification or anything to get them to respond. We're just automatically doing that and we've got used to that. So digital wellness, this has come because heaps of people are overwhelmed by their digital use and their digital sort of compulsions. 
And there's a lot more education around technology, you know, what technology companies do, how they use our data, the things that they're maybe doing that are a bit dodgy. And this has led people to want to have technology balance in their life, which is where digital wellness comes in. And the term digital wellness just means an optimal state of health, personal fulfillment and social satisfaction that each individual is capable of achieving with technology. And because of this, um, it's no longer a luxury to have digital wellness. It's, it's a necessary thing. So here's my digital equilibrium approach or my model. And um, digital equilibrium, so equilibrium is one of my favorite words, just means balance. And the idea with digital equilibrium is that we create lifelong healthy digital habits to thrive online and beyond. And there's six different elements, which you can see on the image. And these all need to be understood so that we can balance them. And how we understand them is we identify an imbalance, a stressor, where we react, where our um, behaviours are addictive and where we may be making some unconscious sort of behaviours. And when we know that, we can manage and change these negative and harmful behaviours into positive and digital healthy habits. And I'm going to go through um, the model now, and you can also download that on my website. And the way that we're going to do this is with three different things that are in that round circle on the side. I've got a concept called pause, consider, decide. And this is when you pause and you are consciously and mindfully making a decision based on considering what's happening. And then there's a cost benefit analysis. So this is like, this is how I make decisions all the time. Write down on a list, all the positives, all the negatives, and hopefully they will be in balance or the positive things will be a bit higher than the negatives. If you've got a heap more negatives, then something needs to change there because that is not ideal. And then the other aspect is reflections. So this is where we're gonna take the time and reflect. And we're thinking about, you know, who am I now? Why am I deciding this? Who are these people in my life? Am I getting um, positivity and joy from people or not? And maybe if I'm not, what needs to change? So my top tips for how to deal with digital wellness are, are revolved around those three aspects. So let's get into the first one, which is digital literacy. So this is where we understand our biases and other people's and security in regards to being online and the data that's shared, privacy aspects, persuasive design, as in how the majority of apps and websites are designed, and misinformation and disinformation. And you might have heard of algorithms, and these are things that are created by the people behind the scenes. And it's like a code that keeps updating. And the people that have created these algorithms, once they've created them, they have no control over them. So they just keep, you know, adding things all the time and it, it's really hard for them to control them. And so these algorithms that exist, they help us consume content on particular um, technology spaces. And remember that if you're not paying for something, that means they have to be making money somewhere. So a lot of companies make money from your data to sell to advertisers. So you've got those things already. But then this leads to an echo, cha echo chambers or filter bubbles where you're just seeing and interacting with things that you already agree with. So if you are like a really um, love cats, you will see a heap of stuff that relates to cats. And if you're like anti-dogs, you're going to see heaps of stuff that's anti-dogs. And um, this creates something called polarisation. I'm sure you've seen that when people are like, mm, I'm a cat fan, no, I hate dogs. Um, and this happens online, but because of the algorithms and because of a thing um, called reach, this just goes out into the ether and there's no, you can't have much control over it. And this polarization 
it means that people that have differing views, the ones who are the loudest, they will be heard the most. It doesn't mean they're the most correct or that everyone agrees with them because the majority of people have moderate views. The majority of people, I like cats and I like dogs. You know, so those people are getting silenced more because they're feeling off. But everyone's saying they feel this way or everyone's saying they feel this way. But those people are being silenced because they don't want to get into debates or be, you know, literally silenced by these other people. And then, so these are just examples of some of the way that technology, technology is used in an exploitative way. And this happens because we don't understand how things are created, how things work and how they impact us. And a big issue too is the lack of regulations and laws, in particular with the US. A lot of the technology companies and people in charge of technology are just allowed to do whatever they like and then maybe they're told to rein it in a bit later. The European Union has some really good um, regulations and laws, but Australia, we're pretty lacking in a lot of that still. And there's a heap of unintended consequences that have come from the way that um, these technologies are designed. And this can be mental health, democracy, and discrimination issues. So some of my tip, top tips here. Um, I hope you've heard of a messaging platform called Signal. It's my favorite. And instead of using, say, Facebook Messenger, which is really bad. Anything to do with Facebook Meta is going to be pretty bad in regards to privacy. So Signal is a really good one to use instead. And instead of using Google, DuckDuckGo is a really good internet search. And always update your privacy settings, whether it's online when you signed into Google, for example, or whether it's any of the apps that you use. Just go through. I go through my privacy settings whenever I get a phone or whenever I get a new um, app or something I download. I just look through every single thing first. And then we'll look into understanding biases. So here's a really good image from The Verge. And this is like telling us to look deeper. So when we're seeing something online, it's telling us, you know, when you should be worried. So for example, you've got a strong emotional reaction to it. If if that's like say that comes from outrage and whatever the latest outrage is of the day when you've got that strong emotional reaction that's what people are looking for so maybe you spread the word or you react to it that's what you know that's what people want um and you want to immediately share that because it's you know it's it's upset you so you want to share it as well and then, you know, check out the link, like who's actually sharing this stuff? Is it someone who is reputable and can be trusted or not? Where's it come from? You know, there's a heap of quotes I see online and they attribute them to, a, you know, um, God or someone from years ago, like Aristotle or someone from years ago, but it's not them who've said it. And you have to do a bit of research first to see where the quote came from. So think about those sort of things, but other things can be used in a really bad way, like in regards to politics, for example. And then what's the context? Is someone just trying to be funny? Like there's a heap of um, websites like The Onion, The Batuta that are satire places. And um, if there's outrage, is, are they just doing that so they can get clickbait on the websites? A lot of media in Australia, US and the UK relies on outrage. And, um, you know, weigh up the evidence. What, what do you believe is right and wrong? You know, some, if you know something in particular about something, but they've missed out all the other things that you also know about it, why have they done that? So think about these things, your own biases and other people's as well. And I want you to pause the next time someone, something upsets you online. And I want you to consider, why do I have a strong emotional reaction to this? And hopefully you will decide not to get caught up in the outrage. Look into the topic later, like maybe sleep on it. Always a good idea. Sleep on it calm down the next day, and you can act instead of reacting. There's a really great documentary called The Social Dilemma 
and I suggest you have a watch of that on Netflix if you haven't seen it before and they've got a website too with a discussion and action guide that I've got later on in the slides. Let's move on to meaningful beneficial relationships. So meaningful interactions are where we have mutual influences that focused on honest, creative, inspirational, knowledgeable, positive people who bring you joy. And beneficial relationships are the connections and the support. And these are made up of quality interactions with people. And we know all this infinite choice that we have it's online, it's everywhere we go. It's like when you go to a restaurant and they've got a hundred menu items and you're like, where do I even start? Do I want noodles? Do I want rice? So all of this is in our heads all the time. It's just, there's too much choice. So that leads to overwhelm. But when we're making choices, there's two different types of people and who make, how they make choices and whether or not they're happy with the outcomes. They're called maximizers and satisficers. So a maximizer is someone who will just always seek for the best. They compare their decisions with others. They use more time and energy when they're trying to make these decisions. And when they've made a decision, they're totally unhappy with the outcome. And on the other side of the coin, you've got satisficers. So these are people who accept good enough and they don't obsess over other options. They can move on after decisions and they're happier with outcomes. So when you're in a conversation, try to interact in a positive and active way that encourages meaningful conversations. When you're interacting with people, try to move beyond the superficial and the surface levels. And meaningful interactions lead to beneficial relationships when expectations between individuals are created. So next time you're viewing the massive amount of people that you can follow and connect with online, I want you to pause. Do you really need to follow anyone else? Or maybe you should just focus on the people you're already connected with. So hopefully you'll decide not to get distracted with all those options and you focus on the already existing relationships you have. And hopefully organize to catch up in person with people that you enjoy chatting with. So try to focus on interacting mindfully online connect meaningfully with people and don't get caught up in superficial interactions and conversations. And let's move on to... And can I just pop in there just for a second? Yep. Just mindful that we're talking to younger people too. So that meeting people in person part, just, you know, like not strange old people that you don't actually know from your act from your real life before you go meeting that, them in person <laughs> that's a very good point there Mandy so yes people that we actually know who we've met in person before or who our parents and families know in person not random people that we <laughs> think we know from being online and interacting with them very good point <laughs> okay moving on to the next one mindful and conscious decision making um, so this is where we're choosing where we direct our attention and we're having less reactive responses. So this is where we're acting, but not reacting. So you're taking a breath first. Um, this is where we're using intentional and active technology. Like you're going online to check your messages from your friends. You're going online to, you know, read an article or something. You're not just scrolling on your phone for hours, you know, while you're waiting to go to bed or waiting for your parents or something. So the key thing here is when your devices are intrusive, you will be reactive. So remember, like I was saying about um, the notifications that we're already reacting to, even if we don't have notifications, we're already reacting to that. So we want to try and train ourselves to not react to those sort of things. And rational and emotional systems control human decision-making outcomes. And both of these um, systems have different associations in your brain. So when we're using mindfulness, this is a conscious perception of the present. And this is achieved when we're open, receptive, and non-judgmental. 
So when we're using this intentional approach, we can holistically think about all the how, why, whens and all that of how we interact with technology. And this can lead us to the effects of our choices and allow us to make better decisions. So um, when you're trying to be intentional and mindful, you can do the pause, consider, decide, which we're going through quite a bit today. And there's another thing you can think about, which is halt. So when you're doing something and you're reacting, is it because you're hungry, you're angry, you're lonely, or you're tired? And um, those things you can change. If you can actually pause and go, oh, I'm hungry at the moment. What can you do if you're hungry? Instead of going online and scrolling, you can just go and make a smoothie or something. And then for the active use, this is where we're actively using technology beyond just the passive ways and thinking about the who, what, when, where and why to show the impacts and allow the better decisions. So when you're about to start scrolling online, next time I want you to pause. And just consider what, why do you want to do this? And is it because of one of the halt aspects? And maybe you'll decide you're actually feeling a bit angry now because of, you know, whatever the latest outrage is. And you understand that when you're angry, you don't make the best decisions. So therefore, you're just going to spend 10 minutes only, maybe set a timer if you need to. And you're going to look at some really cute animal photos because they always make you feel better or some videos, and then you're just going to log off. So think about your social media usage and whether or not your values line up with how you're spending your time. And write down changes you'd like to make, because when you write down a goal, it makes you 40% more likely to achieve it. Um, so halfway through the model, so I want to do a mindfulness exercise with everyone now. So if you're able and willing to um, stand, that would be awesome. If not, you can also um, be seated and just make sure your feet are um, on the floor. So what we're going to do today is pretend we are trees. And we're going to focus on our breathing when we do this as well. So you can close your eyes if you feel comfortable. And what we're going to do is imagine that our legs are the roots of a tree. This tree has been around a long time and it's the roots are just going in so many different directions. With the roots, you've got heaps of nutrients coming up. All the positive stuff from the universe and the earth is coming up through your legs, into your body, into all your pores, and it's coming in through your body. So that's what we're going to visualize today. And you can put your hands on your stomach if you like. And we're going to think about deep breath breaths. It's like diaphragmatic breathing where we're doing a big deep breath. And when we breathe, the stomach is filling up and then the diaphragm, which is just under where your ribs are. And if you can, it can get right up to, um, you know, your chest as well. So let's try and do that. So let's do a breath in. And do a breath out. And you can focus on thinking like, I am breathing in when you do this. And I am breathing out, if that helps. And I'm going to just add in a bit of a mantra here a mantra for the tree. So the tree's mantra today is, I am strong, I am stable, I am resilient. So let's breathe in. I am strong. And breathe out. I am stable, breathe in. And out. I am resilient. Breathe that in and out. Let's do that another time. I am strong. Breathing in and out. I am stable. In and out. 
and I am resilient. And out. Okay. And so let's bring a deep breath in and let's put our hands right up to the sky as we breathe in. Pretend we've got big branches reaching to the top of the stars and blink your eyes open and bring your hands back down through your heart and breathe it out. Thank you, everyone. Hope you enjoyed that. Okay. And so um, I do a lot of mindfulness exercises with my students and you don't have to do it for 20 minutes. You can do it just a couple of minutes like we did there. And just think of it as a transition from one thing to another, okay? So I use that as a transition between half of my model to the other half, for example. But it could be one concept you're working on to another concept or, you know, um, half of your day to the next half. So let's move on to the second half of the model, which this one is on worthwhile communication. This is where we're exchanging relevant and quality information and technology is used to facilitate human interactions, but not to replace them. Um, Nonverbal cues, behaviours and body language all serve as social value signals and these help us work out how others value us, which is then translated into how we feel about ourselves. Now, these are really hard to understand online and especially when you're texting, but because we're adaptable and we can update how we interact, there's different things that we have to think about in regards to the way we interact now. So this can be our intentions. Um, such as how we, the goal of how we're interacting, you know, just to catch up, to have a really in-depth conversation and our individual styles. So say, for example, I've got a heap of introvert friends and, you know, I love a good chat on the phone, but a lot of them don't. And some of them will only ever answer the phone for me. Um, so I um, send a lot of audio messages on the phone and then they can respond in text. So we're just working with how we're both feeling comfortable with the communication. And people love audio messages too because they can hear your voice and they can hear the tone and all that sort of stuff too. Um, and there's a difference between freedom of speech and freedom of reach. So this gets talked about a lot online. And um, the difference here is that because we're talking about the algorithms and outrage spreading, this gets spread very easily, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's right, okay? So just because someone has more followers or there's a lot of people who interact with them, it doesn't mean that's more right than someone who doesn't have those followers. So when we're connecting, we want to use the video and audio calls or audio messages instead of just liking it or texting things, okay? Um, and when we're fo focusing on being present, it's not just in the moment, but it's with yourself. It's with your time and it's with others. Because I'm sure you, you've had communication, you know, having a chat, going to lunch or something with friends. And if everyone's there on their phone in front of you, it's not much of a conversation, is it? Like I, I always remember the people who've put their phone to the side or like really in depth, in, interested and interacting with you. So next time before you're about to share another link about whatever the latest outrage is, I want you to pause and I want you to consider, are you offering anything new to the conversation? And maybe you'll decide, I'm not going to share my views online and maybe you'll just share it with a couple of your friends who know you well, they're not going to judge you, they'll understand what you feel about it. And take the time to organise to speak with your top three friends in the next few weeks. And you can do this in person, on Skype or Zoom or on the phone. For um, maybe if you know people online, um, before you do meet up with them, it'd be great to speak to them on um, a video or Skype or Zoom first. Just make sure they're a real person first. And then let's move on to productivity. So this is thinking about being efficient and using our time and energy in a really good way. I love time and energy management, all about it. Um, and this is really essential um, since a lot of us have been working and studying from home, especially from COVID or since COVID. 
And we really need to focus on minimizing distractions here because when we minimize those distractions, we can emphasize the focus on goals that we need to achieve. And this is a balance of all different things. It's not just your work and your financial goals. It's like your mental, physical, spiritual aspects as well. So when we've got this always on culture, and this is making sure you need a phone, you need to be on this social media platform, you need to do this, you need to do that. It's making us feel like we need to be constantly connected when we don't actually have to. And this is leading us to be distracted and it's leading to shallow work. And this is why you're doing something, but you're not really paying attention. You're totally distracted and you're not giving much value to whatever you're trying to do. And we want to focus on deep work instead. And this is where you're focused, you're in the zone and you can use your brain in a more demanding way because you're in the zone. And how to get your brain to focus, the search online, has increased by 300% since COVID. So a heap of people are feeling this issue. And when we have this unfocused time, especially online, it fuels feelings of anxiety and it increases the risk of depression. And there's a heap of people who have anxiety and depression issues at the moment. And when we're talking about interruptions with our work, 50% of these are self-inflicted. And one of the ways this can happen is by constantly checking your phone. So if you've used your phone now just to check maybe notifications, what's happening on Twitter, um, the next chance of you reusing that device in a few minutes is 50% if you do that now. So that helps me when I'm trying to be in the zone for something. You know, I put my phone out of reach so I'm not able to look at it easily, okay? And um, when we're trying to change some of these aspects, I've given you a heap of information today. So just commit to one thing at a time. You don't have to do all of this at once. And you, there might be things you will never do either. So my top tip is to turn off all notifications. So if you don't do anything else, just turn off notifications. So this is for anything that's not people. So we want to be able to accept phone calls from our friends and family and we want to get their texts and stuff like that. That's fine. But all the other stuff, like your YouTubes, your Facebook, um, all the other social media things you're on, you do not need notifications for that at all times. As I mentioned, keep your device out of reach and put your device on silent as well so you're not constantly hearing all those bings and stuff. And grayscale, it's like black and white. Your phone looks like it's in black and white. And I do this with my phone. I've been doing it for many, many years. And the reason here is that um, your brain reacts to certain things, in particular the colour red. That's why notifications are red, because your brain goes, oh, my God, that's like really important. I have to react to red. So when you have your phone on grayscale, you're not going to react to those red aspects as much. And then let's think about scheduling. We want to create regular and realistic routines that you can commit to and create lists as well. And to-do lists can be overwhelming too. So what I did um, maybe a decade or so ago, I got into this really good habit of instead of like, oh, my God, I'm never going to get through my to-do list, of focusing on one large and one small goal per day. And you can do the other goals, you can do some other things, but as long as you achieve that one large and one small goal today, cool, you've done it, you've had a great productive day. Schedule your time for social media, emails and texts. Like I always check my emails in the morning and before I sign off at night. And when I was doing my social media marketing, for example, I would do that Monday, Wednesdays and Fridays. So I'd have all my channels that I ran as well as all my clients ones as well. So it was quite a lot. But then you have those days and you can do those things. And make sure that you have regular stretch breaks, rest breaks and breaks that are device free. So I know some of my friends who have no technology weekends I always do a 10-day digital detox from Christmas to New Year. 
And um, I also, every night after dinner, I turn my phone off as well. So there's just some ideas. And then um, next time you're about to check your phone, um, I want you to pause. Do I need to be checking my phone right now? And hopefully you will decide that you need to focus on your work so you will check later when you have your next break, whether it's lunch, whether it's the end of the day, whatever your um, later means. So set some time aside this week to turn off all your notifications from things other than people. And our lucky last one is about healthy boundaries and self-care. So this is understanding our needs and being able to express what we expect from each other as well as technology and the boundaries that we have. And keep in mind, you might have different boundaries than your parents as well. So it might also be their expectations and their boundaries as well. So keep those things in mind. And this including mind, body, social, spiritual aspects, our physical and our online environments. And it's encouraging more quality, healthful food, proper habits with our life, including sleep, movement, exercise, nature, gratitude, well-being and mental health. Because almost 60% of people experience screen-related aches and pains that cause physical drain and less productivity. But two-thirds of those people said that they still turn their phone on first thing in the morning. A really good way um, is to maybe not have your phone in your bedroom or close um, to you in the morning. And you can maybe just do a little mindfulness exercise. I do a bit of bed yoga and, um, you know, something like that to start the day for at least the first 15 minutes. Um, higher social media use is correlated with self-reported declines in mental and physical health and life satisfaction. And this is a really big thing and this is a really big issue at the moment, but a really easy thing that we can do is to go outside. Um, I love swimming, ocean swimming, quarry swimming, running, yoga, all that sort of stuff. And I always feel better when I'm outside in green spaces and blue spaces because nature is an antidote to our overwhelm we feel the fatigue we have with the constant attention that we need to give to so many things, and it enhances the way that we make decisions and the way that our brain performs. So one of the things you can think about is this little term that I have that is move a muscle to change a feeling. So this is having regular breaks away from your devices. It's moving around in particular in nature, if you're able, of course. And this is improving all those things that are helping us to learn and understand. And think about decluttering space as well. So when you organise your physical space, this is really helpful for your mental space as well. And think about decluttering things outside of that as well. If you're, you know, following thousands of people online, do you really need to be following that many people? And are you getting something from the people that you're following as well? Because, you know, some people can be quite toxic and you want to bring the joy and the happiness into your life more. And sometimes we have to like really focus on that because of the chaos in the world. And another thing is um, we need to log out of everything at every time. So any website you go on, any app that you use, log out every single time. And this acts as a barrier as well. So think about convenience versus security. It's easy and it's convenient if you're always logged into something, but it's better for your security if you're not. And it's also better because if you have to sign into something, you have to think about it first, don't you? So this is a chance for that pause, consider, decide. You're pausing. Do I need to log into this account at this moment? And because you have to log in and do something physical to that, hopefully maybe you won't then. And I want you to focus on the things that you need to make time for. So this is things like positive people, things you love to do, good sleep, regularly timed sleep, 
you know, not using your phone 30 minutes to an hour before bed will help with that. Yoga, meditation, mindfulness, more greens and whole foods in your diet. Being grateful. One of the things I always do at the end of the day is three things I'm grateful for. Thank you, universe, for this. And it, sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's really hard to find something to be grateful for. But it's even just I got up, you know, or I am still living and breathing. My muscles are working. I was able to, you know, swim 1.2K the other day. You know, whatever it is, like there's always something you can be grateful for. And there's really good studies about once you get into the habit of being grateful, how it changes your mind and gets you to focus on all those positive things more so than the negative. And this can also help when we're doing more creative and inspirational stuff or around people that are doing that. And even, you know, like your favourite music. I've been to see a few bands lately and it just it just gets you in a different mindset. Um, and, yeah, you can see some of my lettering through these slides as well. So being creative and doing the lettering, I love all that sort of stuff. And learning and experiencing something new is also really important. Having the device-free areas and device-free times. So here, when you're at your desk for a long time, I want you to pause and consider, could I use this moment to move a muscle and change a feeling? And hopefully you'll make a decision, take a short break. You know, I'll go outside in the sun and do some stretches. You can walk around when you have a cup of tea or coffee. Go for a short walk around the block with your dog. Catch up with a friend. My friends and I love going bush walks together or the beach and swimming. And, you know, I used to just do lunches with people. And now I'm like, we need to, we need to eat. And then we need to do a walk or something active after. And you can do a lot of... Well, I know not everyone likes a calls, but I like a lot of calls. So you walk around when you're speaking to someone on the phone. And then something to action is to clean up your emails, your desktop images. Heaps of people have really chaotic desktops. You know, just a bit of organisation there and your physical space, including your desk, even maybe your rooms. And factor in some time for movement and downtime away from screens. And remember here that the price of anything is the amount of life you exchange for it. So you need to work out what's important and what's not. So um, I'd love to hear some of people's thoughts and after they've reflected on this, but maybe if you're watching this um, not live, you can just pause this and write down a few things. And um, just to let you know, these, these are things that have helped me for over a decade or so. And um, you don't have to do all of them. Like I said, there's a heap of information. Start with one a day would be good. And just give things a go. And whether or not it works for you depends on you. And um, but just try things first. So think about these, these questions I've got here. What have you learned today? What is the first thing that you will try? A tip there is turn off notifications. Hope you got that one. Um, when do you think you will action this thing that you want to try? So maybe today. When do you think you might struggle the most? I know a lot of people use their phone before bed, so that might be something for you. And who is the person you might want to influence the most? Maybe your parents. Parents can be really bad with digital stuff, so they might be really good people to influence. Maybe your best friend, maybe your brothers or sisters. And who do you think will struggle the most when you instill these changes? Heaps of people really don't like when people change or when people try and be better versions of themselves. So it could cause some problems, but you just lead by example. It's always the best way. And where do you think you could share these skills? Could this be at school, at home? Where would be a great place you could share those? So here's a few things um, that might be good to check out. So I mentioned the social dilemma that was on Netflix, and that's the website. They've got some really good information that you can have a look at as well. Common Sense Media is um, a really good family-based um, website that maybe you could share with your parents and that's got information for you as well. 
Um, I love Tristan Harris from Humane Technology. He does some amazing work with his team and they were involved in the social dilemma as well. And they have your undivided attention podcast that your parents might be like really interested in. And they've got a ledger of harms, which tells you more information on why things are like really um, can be quite bad depending on how they're designed. And then there's a website called Mozilla, which is the Firefox browser, if anyone's used that. So they have a Mozilla foundation that does a lot of really cool um, research on online stuff. And they have this um, information on privacy not included, it's called. So what gadgets, what things, what things you can buy track you or track, you know, children, track your dogs and cats um, or track other people and what don't. So, for example, like Amazon, Facebook, Meta stuff, they're like really bad, but there's some things that are really good. So that might be a good place maybe to send your parents if you've got particular things you want for Christmas. And um, TikTok, I know Mandy mentioned this at the beginning, and this might be a really good documentary to have a look at. It's free on PBS, which is an American website and um, might be something to watch with your parents maybe as well because this is a massive, massive um, social media platform at the moment. So as I mentioned before, you can download the poster with all the stuff that we went through today. And I've got some other resources and stuff on there as well. And um, that's an example of my homepage of my Digital Equilibrium website. Have a look on that. You can send me a um, message through there if you like. And you can find me on Twitter at the moment, depending on if it exists in a day or a week, because there's some dramas there at the moment. That's my favourite. Um, and I'm going to put a video of this presentation on my YouTube channel. And I'm going to put the slides on my SlideShare channel, which is um, Epicenter Equilibrium. Um, which is my consulting business. And I'd like to thank you all for your attention today. I hope you've learned something else. There's some other websites of mine. And yeah, appreciate the chance to spread the word about digital wellness. Mandy, thanks for having me. Thank you. It's fantastic. Um, I might stop the recording and then we could share what we learned. Does that sound okay? Sounds great. Yeah. <laughs>